On Point is brought to you by National Baking Company. Good evening and welcome to On Point. I'm your host, Kalila Reynolds. And I'm Dennis Chung. Well, last week, viewers, Dennis, our show was all about corruption. We had yeah. MOCA here. We had the Commission for the Prevention of Corruption. We had, uh, who else did we have? National Integrity yes, Action. Yes, Professor several. Trevor Monroe was here. This week, though, we're talking something different. But what were some of the main points that you took from that, Dennis? The main thing I took from last week is that we do know what the issues are with corruption. We know that corruption costs us a whole lot, but it just seems as if we speak a lot and we don't put the necessary resources behind it um, to fight it and the, the legislative support. And, and that for me is very important uh, because you know, we, we do spin a good talk here, but it always comes down to at the end how we actually support it with action. Yeah, and I feel like that is the same problem that we have with so many industries, yeah. so you, many things that we can get done. We know what we're supposed yes. to be doing, we're just not doing it. We're a country of studies, <laughs> you know, so we know exactly what we have. The, Every the, now and um, again you just dust off the study. Yeah, and, yeah, we have MOCA, we have the CPC, we have Indicom, we have, we have NIA, we have all of them. But in many instances, what we don't do is we don't put the resources behind it. NIA, you know, they seek their own resources because they're a civil society organization. But the ones that government is responsible for, it seems as if, I, I remember just the other day, the OCG was saying that they didn't have enough money to pay lawyers. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they are the persons who are supposed to ensure that Can the procurement rules. Yeah. Well, it's one crazy. thing that has moved finally beyond the study stage is marijuana. Been, yes. It's been years, probably decades, since people have been recommending what we should be doing yeah. with the marijuana industry. It's finally moving beyond that, and that's our topic this week, one of them anyway. Mm -hmm. We're also going to be talking about Bitcoin's possible introduction into Jamaica. Yeah, and um, from my understanding, it should help us with the corresponding banking situation and also reduce fees significantly in yes. terms of the remittance of money. So, you know, we look forward to that. But before we go there, let's take a look back at some of the top business stories this week. Liberty Global Flow's new parent company is partnering with Netflix. The international cable TV and broadband company has entered into a multi-year partnership with Netflix, which will allow video customers of Liberty Global across more than 30 countries around the world to view its content. At number four, Digicel is eyeing expansion to Cuba. Digicel chairman Dennis O'Brien made the revelation to Bloomberg News this week. He says with Cuba opening up, it is an interesting market with countless opportunities. Number three goes to the epic battle shaping up between Key Motors and Hyundai. Key Motors has been Hyundai's main distributor in Jamaica for over 16 years, but is now suing the car maker for breach of contract by steering business to a competitor. The lawsuit alleged Hyundai delayed shipments to Key Motors, sabotaged their ability to get contracts with the Jamaican government, and failed to make available vehicles with right-hand steering. In at number two is the Economic Growth Council EGC, which published an extensive list of recommendations this week. The 24-page document includes everything from strategies to fight crime to making the foreign exchange regime more credible. And our top business story this week is Jamaica's 11-place improvement on the Global Competitiveness Report. The island moved from number 86 to 75 out of 138 countries ranked. Jamaica beat out the Dominican Republic at 92 and Trinidad and Tobago at 95. However, Barbados still tops the region at number 72. BlackBerry's announcement that it will stop designing smartphones in-house snags it an honorable mention this week. The phones were once all the rage in Jamaica and even with President Obama. But after years of struggling to compete with rivals such as Apple and Samsung, they've decided to outsource hardware development. They're now saying software is the new BlackBerry. And when we come back, we talk marijuana on the corner. Welcome back. 
Well, for decades and probably even centuries now, marijuana has had negative connotations. But it's now a ballooning global industry. You have medical marijuana, even recreational marijuana, and it is gaining traction. Jamaica definitely wants to get a piece of that pie. So here's a look back at the impact of the global marijuana industry. Jamaica's ganja legislations have long been coming, so when government backbencher Raymond Price started agitation to get the laws amended, he had support from all corners. The discussions involved several stakeholders with numerous back and forth. By February 2015, the Senate had amended the Dangerous Drug Act. A few months later, in April 2015, the new ganja laws were gazetted. The government said the laws were aimed at strengthening respect for the rule of law and building a more just society by eliminating a common cause of corrosive antagonism between the police and young men, particularly in less affluent communities, reducing the heavy burden of cases on the resident magistrates' courts, acknowledging the constitutional rights of the Rastafari community who use ganja as a sacrament, and paving way for the emergence of a lawful, regulated, legitimate medicinal and industrial marijuana industry that may have significant economic opportunities and benefits. While Jamaica is still working out how to make money from its marijuana industry, other countries are already cashing in. Globally, the marijuana industry is estimated to worth billions of dollars. A new report by a leading marijuana industry investment and research firm found legal cannabis sales in the U.S. jumped 17% to $5.4 billion in 2015, and they will grow by a whopping 25% this year to reach $6.7 billion. Meanwhile, industry experts expect the industry to be worth 50 billion U.S. dollars by the year 2026. And we're joined now by Eleanor Hussey. She's a director at the Cannabis Licensing Authority, the CLA. We had hoped to be joined by Basil Hilton from the Kingston and St. Andrew chapter of the Ganja Growers Association. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. But welcome to On Point, Eleanor. Thank you very yeah, much, Welcome, Kalina. Eleanor. Thank you. Thanks. So tell me, um, where are we with this um, ganja licensing now? Because we've been hearing about it for a long time. For a long time, yes, because the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act was right. actually passed in 2015. Mm -hmm. But the regulations which were to come from that were uh, passed earlier this year uh, and gazetted in June. So since June of this year, the CLA has been accepting license applications. So June, July, August, end of September, three months you've been accepting. How many have you accepted and processed and how many have you granted? Well, um, let me go back a bit. You know, once it was gazetted in June, the CLA embarked on a, a, a public uh, consultation uh, series. So in that way, we, we try to get the uh, the regulations out to the people who most need to know. So we went to the parishes to speak to the farmers. And that took, uh, that was over a six week period. So it was after that, that applications started to come in. So far we have had 81 wow. applications in, which are 81. in various stages in of the, the different process. Categories. There are five uh, licensed categories. Mm -hmm. And yes, the applications have come across the board. But these fees seem so high. I mean, the, the annual license fee, the fee per application. The, the, this is not for the small man, as was um, intended. And, and that is a point that did come up, Dennis, for sure, in our public consultations. It is actually a very emotive point at this time. And the truth is that the Cannabis Licensing Authority is an authority that is starting from scratch. It's an authority that has to uh, be self-financed. And so fees and license application fees are part of the process. Now, uh, all things considered, once you're up and running in the business, these renewal fees or these fees are not as hefty as they seem. But what is hidden in this process is probably the conditions that the prospective license holders have to meet prior. So if we're looking at the small man, the grassroots farmer who is growing up in the hills, uh, he has, a, to say a pun, a steep hill to climb yeah. with these regulations because there are certain yeah, requirements such as security, yes. fencing, security cameras. Electronic surveillance. Right. So to be honest, so even though uh, the application fee for the tier one cultivator 
or sorry, should I say the license fee, has actually been deferred to the end of the license period, okay. the one year. So it would be payable and due. The infrastructure at the end. costs. But the infrastructure are costs. So, so, and, just so to give, and just to give you the viewers an idea what those fees mm -hmm. are, so the cultivator's license is two thousand US dollars. That's what two hundred and fifty thousand Jamaican yeah. dollars. That's the tier one. At uh, tier two, two thousand five hundred US per acre. Tier three, three thousand US per acre, and it goes up from there. Processing license up to ten thousand US dollars for a processing license. Transport license, ten thousand US dollars for the first, first vehicle. vehicle. That's a million Jamaican, over a million Jamaican dollars. So, yeah. so we can see how some people would say this is prohibitive for the guy who is trying to move yeah. his business from a legal business to now and from sorry from an illegal, illegal. business right. to a legal business. And to be honest, though. Uh, most of those persons in the legal business who mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are not the primary producers, the cultivators and the growers, probably have enough uh, resources to meet these application fees. Our primary yeah, but, concern but what, what, is what, the small farmer. Yeah, but you're right. What I'm telling the small farmer who plants in this thing and he's illegal now and you know, a lot of them are out there, they're going to remain illegal. Well, Dennis, the, That's farmer, basically <laughs> the farmer is in is producing a crop that is illicit right now. He mm. himself is not illegal. We right. recognize that um, it, is, it is difficult for them to step into this full regulatory system. However, the regulatory system is essential. Yeah. What our challenge is at this time is to find a solution to engage and incentivize the small farmer and those who have been producers in this industry uh, on the illicit side for many years, uh, find a way to find their way into the regulated yeah. industry. And, and I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, I understand the need for the infrastructure cost because if we don't have it, then places like the US are going to look on and, and say, well, you know, you guys are just allowing people to grow this thing freely. Um, so I understand the need for it. but. The concern that was noted initially by many small farmers is that, you know, they're just going to carry the big man in and, you know, we, we're, we're not going to... They're just going to box so. us out. And, and, and their concern is, is valid, but our regulations mm -hmm. and our mandate are written uh, in order to put in some protections. So, for example, uh, the big man from foreign would have to partnership would have to be in partnership with a local okay. investor. And uh, it is written that uh, the, the uh, substantial ownership should be based local. with a resident, a, a, mm -hmm. an entity or an individual that is ordinarily resident, resident in Jamaica. So that keeps um, the industry within our shores. Now, the challenge even in that is that uh, the incentive to move from illicit to licit um, has not been quite defined. Mm -hmm. I think that most people who operate in an industry that is uh, uh, illegal uh, do want to come into the light. But how they do that is our challenge. We are actually looking at innovative um, systems uh, that have been used for years in the UN to try and reduce the world drug problem. Um, mm -hmm. There's such a program called um, alternative development. Now that normally means the eradication of an illicit crop. And so in its traditional format, um, most people would reject that program. Mm -hmm. But one of the ways to look at it is to change an illicit crop to a licit one. So we're not changing the crop itself, but we're changing the market right, that right. that crop right. then goes to. Yes. So that's a, and alternative development is, um, it, it's a UN program. So it's, it's, it's a government um, sponsored uh, program that would uh, look to register the small farmers within their communities, mm -hmm. seek and find assistance for them and assist, help them to get regulated. So it would be like a transitional period. This is still in the early talks, mm -hmm. but it is one of the ways in which uh, we are considering uh, 
how the small farmer can actually come into the industry. Of the 81 applications you've received so far, what's the most popular category? I imagine cultivation? No. Well, um, I'll let you know. And uh, it's the, the mo the, of, of the 81 applications, there are 22 applications for the retail side and there are 22 applications for cultivation. Mm -hmm. Those are the mm -hmm. two largest categories. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that truly reflects um, how the industry should start as well, because the value added that will come uh, through mm -hmm. processing, product development, um, is in the mix, it's mm -hmm. in the pipeline. Right now what you can get mm -hmm. is uh, immediate product, and an immediate consumer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that that you know, our applications do reflect. I well, think. I, I, I hope you have applications for transportation. Arrest, and we do. Otherwise, it'll be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> do you find you have the same people applying for different categories of licenses, or you have different people? Well, it's, it's not prohibited um, mm -hmm. for anyone mm -hmm. to apply for any or all right. of the. Um, uh, license categories. So you can apply to grow, distribute, You can retail. apply to do research and development, uh, to then grow, to then process, transport, and retail. But it mm. will cost you. It will cost because at <laughs> each yeah. you have license level you license. have a new license. Yeah. So, so when do we expect that this is going to be operationalized and people are going to start when this industry is actually going to start? Is there a projected timeline? Um, well, to be honest with you, uh, we would hope that the first license holders would be granted within the next four to six months. But granting the so, license. So next year, then? By next I think, year, that, is will be I think this. that is realistic. So right now you have the applications, you just haven't granted the license. And they're in yet. process. And actually, um, the, the, we estimate that our license um, process could take up to six months. And part of that process is actually the due diligence that's undertaken mm. by FID. Um, that could take up to four months. And it's a necessary part of the uh, pre-licensing. But even if we do fast track licenses and they are uh, issued before that time, we still have the challenge of starting our new agency. It, it needs to be fully staffed. It needs to have its systems up that, and That's CLA? The CLA. Yeah, but, but the you, regulatory you, you, you have to you're make not fully sure that you're up. Yet and you're not up yet? Uh, we have our, our board is fully functional. We are going through the process of being a government agency, which requires some degree of bureaucracy. A we lot are, of bureaucracy. Okay, a lot of bureaucracy. <laughs> a lot of bureaucracy. But in some ways, if we do not follow the necessary processes yeah. and procedures, with hindsight, we may not uh, be held, you know, uh, we may be held accountable for some discrepancies. I, so, imag so, I imagine that all your staff has to go through a stringent due diligence process. Eh? People are going well, to be working there. You know, recruiting is, is, is uh, quite a, a diligent process. It's thorough. It involves more than one ministry. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, that is one of our challenges, in making sure that everything is ready for the issuing of licenses. It's unfortunate we don't have the Ganja Growers Association here because I'm sure they would have raised some concerns about the process. And do you know, uh, they're one of our allies. We must collaborate and work with the industry stakeholders. Otherwise, we would not be able to bring a realistic uh, framework and regulatory system to the fore. Mm. You know, so, yeah. one of the issues that we've seen with this industry as it has been emerging in, say, Colorado in the United States is the issue of banking these uh, businesses, yes. these burgeoning ganja businesses, because the banking system sees the, still has a stigma against the industry and fears money laundering and that type of thing. How do we approach this or how are we approaching this in Jamaica to make sure that people who go through the process pay all the fees have all their ducks in a row, are able to access finance and, and banking services? It's a very real concern, and you bring up two uh, distinct points, accessing finance and accessing banking services. 
No, we've had some dialogue with the Colorado uh, MED, that's the Marijuana Enforcement Division, that's their regulatory arm. And their experience has been that initially, when they started, 80% of the industry was unbanked and 20% 20 uh, was banked. Now, several years on, it's the reverse. Mm. They mm. now find yeah. that 80% uh, are, are banked. So in, although access to banking services is an issue, it is not, uh, it's not it, going it's to prevent. It's a matter of building trust, eh? Right, it won't and prevent confidence. the industry but, starting. But that's in the United States as well. They've it had is. a few years experience and they're not facing the de-risking crisis that we're facing where banks are already, correspondent banks are already dropping local banks as clients because of mm. these fears of money laundering. Add ganja to that mix and... True, and you know, Jamaica that is actually, you know, a poster child for the region for anti-money laundering, we're mm. not on the list. Um, it's, it's extremely difficult to be banked here under normal circumstances in order to stay off that anti-money laundering list. So it's something we're very mindful of. There are solutions, uh, banking solutions, uh, that have come up in the jurisdictions. So, so in the next segment, we're going to be speaking with Bitcoin, which is a sort of mobile money. Um, you're, you, you're going to be interested in that? Mobile I would think money. that the industry would be interested. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the licensing authority is most interested in making sure that there is no diversion in or diversion out of either illegal product or um, illegal cash. So it is important for the authority to pay attention, but it's more important for the players. As you mentioned that point, that raises something interesting. How do you know that some of these cultivators or retailers aren't mixing illegal product with the legal, legally grown? Very ganja? good question. Mm. And it's something that um, has been taken care of in some ways by our US counterparts. Uh, in in uh, staying within, federal guidelines, uh, the states that have gone full adult use, which is with um, recreational as well, have to abide by uh, the coal memo, which came from the US um, uh, State Department. One of those um, main points is the prevention of diversion in or out. And the solution for that is a tracking system which is really the backbone of the regulatory system. Uh, it's seed to sale tracking. So you, literally, it's a system that follows the plant from the seed to sale to the consumer. Right, right. Oh, <laughs> lots more to talk about yeah. as it relates to ganja. That last point, I would definitely want to expand upon <laughs> another time. Seed to sale tracking, yeah, uh, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're going to geotag it. I know, I know <laughs> that there are some very stringent systems out there for tracking it. Because yeah. I've, I've actually seen um, a demonstration of, of, of one of them. Yes. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Eleanor. Uh, interesting discussion yes. here on Ganja. That's Eleanor Hussey, Director at the Cannabis Licensing Association, the CLA. When we come back, we talk Bitcoin and Caracoin. What is it? How can it work in Jamaica? Welcome back. Well, Jamaica may soon have its first licensed Bitcoin exchange. That's if the founders of Caracoin have their way. They've already launched in Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. Now they're eyeing Jamaica. But what exactly is Bitcoin and how does it work? Here's more. A Bitcoin is a form of digital currency which is created and held electronically. Bitcoins aren't printed like money most of us are accustomed to. They're produced by individuals and businesses running computers using software that solves complex mathematical problems. Bitcoins are a prime example of a growing category of money known as cryptocurrency, which can be used to buy things electronically. In that sense, it's like conventional currencies which are also traded digitally. However, Bitcoin's most important characteristic and the thing that makes it different from conventional money is that it is decentralized. That means no single institution controls the Bitcoin network. 
A company from Barbados known as Bit.com is the first in the region to successfully run an exchange where Bitcoins can be traded for other currencies. Bit.com is the same company which got the Barbados Central Bank in February to agree to digitize the Bajan currency. And we're joined now by Karsten Becker. He's Regulatory Advisor at Caracoin. Welcome to On Point. Hi. Welcome, welcome Karsten. Uh, tell us in your own words, very briefly, what exactly is Bitcoin? How does it work? So Bitcoin is a revolutionary new form of digital currency that allows people to transfer money around the world without fees, without costs. And um, as you can imagine, in the Caribbean, this is a big deal where you know, the GDP of some of the countries is built on remittance. And the fees there are extremely high. So Bitcoin gives you a way to work around the corresponding banks, work around the remittance providers, and save in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars. But how useful is it as opposed to, say, doing a wire transfer or just doing an online transaction like a PayPal? Well, I mean, like a, a wire transfer has fees, takes time, right? $30, $40 to, to send, maybe $15, $20 to receive. And it's also not instantaneous. It also has to go through the banking system. So that limits who can send and receive wires as well. Bitcoin allows anyone with a Bitcoin wallet to directly send funds back and forth between them practically in real time. But there must be some fees associated or else you wouldn't make any money. Well, there's a minor fee um, called a mining fee, but it's actually a fraction of a fraction of a cent. And it's more of a way of recording the transaction in a public ledger where all the Bitcoin transactions are actually stored and monitored. So it's a public system, right? So it's regulated by the people, not by institutions. As I listen to it, though, I mean, one of the concerns that most come to mind is how do you deal with this in, with respect to the anti-money laundering, you know, to ensure that people don't get on? Who well, anti-money laundering is a, different, is a difficult case, um, I think especially in the Caribbean. So when 9-11 happened, the, Amer the force of the American government actually came down on Western Union and said, right, these are the guys who, you know, the money came through that supported the terrorists and so on and so forth. But, would you, do you see Western Union as a money laundering organization? No, right? So Bitcoin being unregulated, it does, like any industry, have concerns that come along with it. But the reality is the, the money laundering, the drug dealers, they're already deeply embedded in the, embedded in the existing financial systems. So they're not looking for to, to work in an area where there's already a lot of scrutiny and a lot of eyes. But when people hear unregulated, wouldn't this be an area that would attract these type of undesirables? I don't think so. I think unregulated is, a, is more of a term coined by the financial system to say that we have not figured out how to control it yet. So we don't want you to be near it so, until so we can it? charge fees. Um, fortunately, you can't control it. You have companies like Caracoin who try to make it safer and easier for people to use, right? So we help to manage conversion rates. So, you know, you can actually send Bitcoin back and forth between people using your own local currency as an exchange rate. Mm. The transactions happen as Bitcoin, but we help to make it easier, safer, and faster for you to actually use this new currency. And how does someone actually use a Bitcoin to purchase something? If you well, want how to do you get card? one first? Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a digital token. Um, the, you have Bitcoin exchanges are really the mm. point where you buy and sell and get in and out of the system. So you'd sign okay, up with an okay. exchange and then purchase Bitcoin. Now, one Bitcoin has a value of, say, $600, but it's a US. digital token, US, yeah. So you can actually purchase one-tenth of a Bitcoin, or you can buy $20 worth of Bitcoin. It's fractional, so anybody So, so a broker actually, will change you in and out? In and out, essentially. This is the job okay, of the okay. exchange. So right, you have the right, exchange, right, and right. then the wallet is just like any mobile right, money right. platform. That. So we're trying to streamline it even further by integrating the exchange into the wallet. So you could actually link your, your debit card, link your banking, and purchase $100 worth of Bitcoin. Use that to do transactions, shop mm -hmm. online, pay for goods, and what's left over, sent to someone else who could then use it, say, to buy mobile top-up. And, you know, sometimes it comes full circle at that point. But I could just point. use my credit card to do that. Yes, but remember, I think over 50% of the Caribbean is unbanked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't have access to credit cards. Right, right. And anyone actually can immediately sign up, install a Bitcoin wallet solution, and get up and running in probably 
30 seconds. So how would they do that? Would they have to go online to do that? All they need is a smartphone, and as we know in Jamaica, over I think 90% mm -hmm. of the population mm -hmm. already have smartphones. The smartphone, you go online, you search for one of the apps, or is this Caracoin, so you'd search for Caracoin, install it, link it to your phone, and immediately you're up and running. At that point, you can request Bitcoin from someone you know who already has Bitcoin. So people overseas in the UK, they have Bitcoin ATMs, so someone could walk up, load, it, load their wallet with 100 pounds worth of Bitcoin right, and right. send it to you here with no fees. So it's a form of mobile money. It is exactly, mobile money right. just done right. Mm. without the fees. It, it, it's, it's the internet for money, eh? Exactly. It's, it's global. Yes. Yes. Um, but, but what is preventing it from being introduced in countries like Jamaica and, and the So Caribbean? of course, You're, you know, the, the Caribbean is already under a lot of scrutiny because of the de-risking yeah. um, right, by right. the corresponding banks. They, they have a lot of problems, they're looking for solutions, but they need to play their cards very carefully because you know, the IMF and so on have mm -hmm. a lot of power mm -hmm. and control. Mm -hmm. And I think just like the cannabis industry they, they have to choose their battles slowly so we are trying to work with the local banking infrastructure to figure out how to bring in a system that has a lot of benefit and minimize the risks and you're explaining to me during the break that you haven't launched in those other countries that I mentioned yet we, you're only available we're available so I mean our wallet is currently available in pretty much all the languages of the Caribbean we support all the currencies anyone can actually get up and running, install it, and use it. But in order to actually integrate into the banking system, which would then open it up to merchants as a payment solution, mm -hmm. open it up to allow people to sell mm -hmm. online, mm -hmm. you really need that last layer of banking integration. And Jamaica is one of the few islands in the Caribbean that already has uh, electronic funds uh, infrastructure in place right, right. that can be built on. So they're building on that to roll out mobile money. They can build on mm. that to roll out cryptocurrencies or digital currency solutions. It was just a couple of weeks ago we had the discussion about mobile money and how long it has taken them to get the regulatory yeah. approval, which is good for you because they basically did the groundwork for you yes, now that so. Caracoin is ready to launch. But how far are you in terms of the regulatory process and getting up and running in Jamaica? Well, that's really up to the BOJ and the Ministry of Finance to, to hopefully better see the advantages. We believe that most of the mobile money solutions, by the time they really hit the market, are pretty much obsolete. They have per transaction fees, for instance. So if I send you $100, they're going to charge you 5 bucks. With right. Bitcoin, there's no fee. I send you $100, you get $100, you pass it on. So this is actually a major deal when rolling out a mobile money platform. So who's going to want to move from cash to a system where if you pass $100 around the table, 50 bucks is all that comes back, right? So you're saying then that, that the introduction of Bitcoin would actually have an effect of reducing fees? Should have a significant system. effect. I mean, if it will have a massive effect on the remittance sector, for instance, when people actually realize that people can send them money without fees. And on the banking sector, when people realize that all of a sudden there's a way that anyone can start to sell their products online, it should open merchants up and open the Caribbean up to the world. And, so and you have been speaking to the regulators here, right? Eh? Yes. And now what's the response? They're very delicate. <laughs> 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 so, so question though, if there are no fees or very minuscule, right. how do you make money? So we make money, or, or hope is to first of all bring something to the Caribbean that can be adopted on a large scale. And then just like the Bitcoin network has micro fees, which are a fraction of a fraction of a percent, we can tap into that underlying infrastructure of micro fees and hopefully push some of it also onto the merchants. So with a Bitcoin exchange, the process of cashing out, you can actually charge a merchant at that mm -hmm. point. You know, they mm -hmm. already pay two to three percent mm -hmm. for regular credit card transactions. I know that new merchants are, are now being told they have to pay up to six, seven percent in order to, for instance, mm -hmm. sell online. Mm -hmm. So we can allow merchants to sell online for two percent, one percent, or to have them sell online for no fees and just charge them at the cash out process when we have to deal with the banks and the regulators for them. Let, let me ask you, we were previously discussing the whole thing of the cannabis, the ganja industry. And I, I know that in Colorado, for example, they have a problem of people not wanting to bank them. Mm -hmm. Right. W would this be a solution for- It would be a perfect solution, yes. Because you, tourists could come with their Bitcoin, they could safely pay 
for goods, products, and services. That whole process could be tracked very easily mm -hmm. because the, the Bitcoin network is open. It, it doesn't store personal information, but it's open mm -hmm. to anyone to see transactions. So you'd have a much better insight into what's right. going on. And then at the end of the day, it would allow the merchants to, to have a, a layer between them and the banking system. So the banks could you know, pass some of the, the regulatory concerns off their back until the government can figure, it, figure out how to regulate it. I mean, in the States, it's legal at the state level, but it's illegal at the federal level. So since banks are fed, federally regulated, so it's going to be a long time before uh, a cannabis company will be able to own a bank account. Well, I, I tell you, one of the questions that I know people have, especially politicians, is you're going to make this investment, but what sort of jobs do you expect, number of jobs do you expect to create? Because it sounds like you just have this platform, you know, where you can no, be No, it's very interesting. The, the, the head of the UN actually did a report earlier on this year calling for the Caribbean to, to become the digital currency hub of, of this part of the hemisphere. So previously you had offshore banking, which grew massively, brought lots of money to the Caribbean, lots of jobs. But with the de-risking of, of the banking system, offshore banking is collapsing. I mean, they're actually going into offshore banks and getting the names of all the people mm -hmm. and releasing it to the public. So who wants to put their money in the Caribbean in an offshore bank anymore? So digital currencies are kind of the next generation because they're private, they're secure but you can regulate them at the same time. As you mentioned secure, how secure is it really? Because the, you, you also mentioned unbanked, there's a, a large percentage of unbanked people in this region. And that's because lots of these people, one of the reasons anyway, are just don't Bankable. trust the banking mm -hmm. system. They yes. rather keep their money under their mattress mm -hmm. somewhere. Exactly. And you've been hearing the examples very recently of people who've been hacked, whose credit cards have been skimmed, and we were talking about it on the show recently. So how secure is something like Bitcoin and Caracoin? Well, at the end of the day, I don't think the people have been backed, hacked. I think the banks have been hacked, right? Mm -hmm. It's the bank's ATM that was right. hacked. It was the lack of security at the banking level that allowed someone to install money. a skimmer. Yeah. Exactly, and the, mm -hmm. banking, the bank is responsible at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right? So Bitcoin is w a lot more secure from the perspective that if it's all on your phone, all digital, you, you, it's much safer to move money between people. You don't actually have to go to an ATM to pull anything out. So you eliminate one point of being robbed at the end of the day. And since there is no bank as another in intermediary, you don't have the risk of the bank, banking institution getting hacked and you losing your money. So you do have the risk of someone like us who is helping to manage your Bitcoin wallet getting hacked. Mm -hmm. um, it's always a problem. I think for every lock, you'll mm -hmm. find a thief. So. Any financial institution has to work hard to minimize that. Now, fortunately, the Bitcoin network itself is unhackable, right? There's, I think, when, when you think of a system where money is actually stored digitally, that's possibly untraceable. Every, every hacker in the world for the past four years has been trying to get to the money. So over the, the past four years, it's built up a level of security where it's pretty much impossible to do without you divulging your password. But at the end of the day, you can't really secure every so single have you, have you ever had a security breach? We have not. We partner with a company in the States called BitGo, who's the largest security provider in the digital, digital currency space. I think they move a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin um, a year back and forth, and they have never had an incident. So we have partners to help us. So what's the total value of the Bitcoin um, industry? I think Bitcoin is worth over $10 billion right now. Wow. It's US. It's $600 for one. It's going up. It goes up you know, based on, since it's a currency for the people, the more people use it, the more the value goes up. Very interestingly, it's $600 for one. No, but about a year and a half ago, it was $200. So if you had actually purchased $1,000 worth of Bitcoin a year and a half ago, you'd have tripled your money. So it can be an investment. Also, yes. A lot of people use it as an investment vehicle. If you want to take that bet that it yeah. will continue appreciating in they value. They say it'll go up to about three, four thousand. Yeah. You never know. Dennis, do you, uh, buy some well. Bitcoin? <laughs> do you want to buy some Bitcoins from me? <laughs> <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> you heard it on record. <laughs> right. So what's, yeah. what's the next step? Well, the next step is to continue rolling out our solution, to continue to engage merchants, to get them to see 
the value in, in the system. I mean, Bitcoin is being widely accepted in third world countries like, I believe in the Philippines, they brought the, the, the cost on remittance from seven to eight percent down to about one to two percent by moving mm -hmm. to a Bitcoin based system. Argentina is using it as a solution for the, the lack of foreign exchange. Pretty much every restaurant, bar, hotel in Argentina accepts Bitcoin. Tourists come, they spend Bitcoin, and the, the small merchants are able, able to send that back overseas to pay bills for goods, products, and services overseas. So we believe when there's something that actually helps the little man, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the little man at the end of the day is going to figure out how to use it, right? Yeah. And we are the little people. so. This is our interest in it, you know? Yeah, I tell you, technology is just getting more and more advanced every day. Well, thanks exactly. so much for joining us, Karsten. Karsten Becker, Regulatory Advisor at Caracoin. When we come back, we'll have this week's numbers as well as the word on the street. Welcome back. Well, earlier in the show, we had a very informative discussion about Jamaica's burgeoning ganja industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Here are the numbers. According to a 2005 United Nations World Drug Report, the global marijuana industry is worth over 140 billion U.S. dollars. The United Nations estimates that 164 million people around the world use marijuana. Legal marijuana sales are expected to hit nearly seven billion U.S. dollars in the United States this year, after anticipated growth of some 25 percent over last year. Marijuana sales jumped 17 percent last year to 5.4 billion dollars. In the Netherlands, where recreational marijuana has been legal for several years, the government collects an estimated 400 million euros a year from the country's 730 marijuana-selling coffee shops. The Dutch sell about 265,000 kilos of hashish and marijuana a year, raking in gross revenues of 3.2 billion U.S. dollars. And now we hit the streets. Our on-point team asks, should marijuana be fully legalized in Jamaica? No, my medicinal purpose is good enough, but more time the work of people, them all the young people, them see a pass all of them, big old weed in their mouth and them something there. And them two look proper to me. I used to smoke it, I don't smoke it again, but medicinal purpose, that good. I think they only should um, legalize it for medicinal use only because reason being, if it's freed up, people might take disadvantage of situation being as what is going around in the world now. Boy, that's a tough one, you know, because there are pros and cons and, you know, yes, it's good for medicinal purposes, but then some of us use it otherwise, and then our, our, our structure cannot manage it, and so sometimes it can have negative or adverse effects. Well, I mean, I really have a problem with all them are with it still. No? But I mean, yeah, they need to um, legalize it more still, because, the, um, you see, a man with a little three pound and a little five pound, or, or, yo, it just needs to, you know, even a ten pound, because a poor man, you know. But if you have a law, you have a law for you, you know, even a 10 pound or you legalize it every day. No, I really don't think so because we know the effects of marijuana can be very detrimental to the health. Uh, or if you do it socially, just do it habitually, you mean like daily. But for medicinal purposes, I give it a thumbs up because that's the way to go for it. Well, as far as how many seeds still, you know, ganja the hill and the nation and it, it, if it are used for us, the hospital alone or just that alone, Come like, I prefer just legalize and just make everybody profit from it and make the country on a, a better terms. Because I feel that like ganja is the way, you know, towards the suffering, you know, where I go on in a jail, you know. I don't mean, I mean like if a man have a, a 10 or a 5 pound, you know, he can sell it like all one, 50 bag, 100 bag, and he still have to say a thing. I don't kill him, I'm going to kill people. But that is my views all about the marijuana.
Welcome back. Well, wow, Dennis. I, yeah. This is one of the weeks where I really wish we had more time, more time. and I wish yes, that our second yes. guest could have made it as there's well. There's so much more to discuss about the ganja. You know, Eleanor was telling yeah. us a lot more off air. Maybe we should have had some samples here, <laughs> so we could have had a very interesting <laughs> show. You know? I mean, hey, yeah. I, I wouldn't oppose it. <laughs> but she was telling us uh, during the break that how they propose to manage the system and how it's been managed yeah. in the United States, for example, is they actually physically tag each and every yeah. ganja plant. So I, from, they have from seed to sale tagging. Yeah, I, I actually saw a documentary on it on CNN, of what they do in Colorado, and that's very true. They track every single thing. It's a, it's a highly electronic industry. So yeah, it comes back to the point, and when you look at the requirements that are there, this is not for the small man as well. it was thought initially. I mean, I remember when the, the, it was the initial announcement was made that the two ounces are going to be legal and you know, everybody's out there celebrating, you know, I, I, I'm going to get into this legal industry. People are not going to be able to afford it from a, you know, a small man point well, of view. Well, like Eleanor also mentioned, yeah. some of the players in the ganja industry who are now illegal, they're not short of cash. No, <laughs> they, they, no, they do profit they're from not, the illegal trade. They're not, they're, they're, they're not short of cash. Um, but, you know, just to put that electronic infrastructure in place, some of them, there are going to be geographical challenges with some of them also to get that in place. So if you don't have the appropriate infrastructure where your farm actually is right now, you know, and then if, if you have a small farm, does it make sense from a return point of view? You know, these are some of the, the questions you're going to have to ask. So I think you're still going to have an illicit trade going on. Yeah, and listening to all these requirements, it's clear as well why we haven't actually started approving the licenses yeah. yet. Although the CLA already has the applications, they're not ready. They're not ready to yeah. see the full legal industry. And, and, and then, and then we spoke about the bitcoins, which, which ties in very closely to this you know, because they funny, can use it. When we were planning these segments, I didn't see how the two yeah, yeah. coalesced, but they yeah. do go hand in hand. Yeah, for real. because I mean, I, I that same documentary I was watching. The guys in Colorado has all this cash in their house, you know, that yeah. hundreds of thousands of yeah. US dollars um, that they couldn't bank. Um, so Bitcoin, mobile money, is actually a solution for them. You know, so, I mean, both things complement each other, but, you know, we, we'll see how it works, you know, because I think just as difficult as it is to get the ganja legal in, in Jamaica, I think that mobile money is going to have a difficult time also because of our anti money in laws and all of that. Yeah, because imagine me going out yeah. to a bank and saying, I want a loan to grow a ganja farm, yeah, <laughs> to start yeah. a ganja yeah, farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, hmm, how easy is that going to be? Well, that's our show for this week, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching. You make our show possible thanks to all our sponsors, to our hardworking production team, and to our guests. I'm Khalilo Reynolds. And I'm Dennis Chung. See you next week. On Point was brought to you by National Baking Company.